Hello everyone at Big Play. I'm here with my mentor and my great friend John White. Now for those of you who are new to the racing game, John White is an absolute legend. One of the youngest stewards in the history of American racing. Uh, he has done everything from the morning line odds that you see at the racetrack, including major racing events like the Breeders' Cup. He's a Washington Hall of Fame inductee. Uh, you guys might have heard of a guy named Bob Baffert, who is a six-time Kentucky Derby winning trainer, two-time Triple Crown winning trainer. Well, that guy reads John White's columns when he writes things. John has done anything in racing and more, you name it. He is, we don't throw this, this name around lightly, a legend, and it is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for uh, helping us today, John. Good to be with you, Ryan. John, the people at Big Play have purchased a, a share in a horse named Improbable Luck. Mm -hmm. He recently had a workout for a guy you know quite a lot about, D. Wayne Lucas. Now, back in the days when he was here in Southern California all the time, you were around him uh, covering him from the daily racing form. Is that correct? Yeah, on a daily basis. That is correct. Yes. So I <clears throat> thought it would be kind of interesting if we could watch part of Improbable Luck's uh, breeze mm -hmm. and discuss it. Mm -hmm. And by the way, guys, a breeze is another term for a workout. So we're going to watch his workout here, just a part of it. And I thought you could kind of discuss what we're seeing in his work patterns, how Lucas will probably be preparing him next, and maybe explaining what where we're at in his cycle of works now. So why don't we take a look here. If you were to go on Equibase right now, you would see uh, Improbable Lux workout history. This is his fourth lifetime workout, okay? Well, start right there, Ryan, because look at the pattern and you can see it. The first workout, three furlongs, is thir fifth best of eight that morning. So he worked 36 and 0.40, that's 36 and two fifth seconds. So there were eight workouts that morning at that distance on that track, not the turf course, not another track, that track, and he had the fifth fastest. So that's a moderate workout. Look what you see in the next workout. That's what you call a fast workout, 34 and change. 34.40, that's 34 and two fifth seconds. And look at it. it was a what you call a bullet workout because when it appears in the daily racing form, they put a little bullet next to it, meaning it was the fastest for that distance that morning at that track. So it was the best of 18 that morning. Now, typically, what you'll see most trainers, and this includes Mr. Lucas, he's not going to come back and work them fast again because you don't want to to put too many fast works workouts in a two-year-old too fast. It can take a toll. It mentally and physically. So look what he comes back. He comes back with a four, and he stretches the distance a little bit, four furlongs from three. So three furlongs, three furlongs, now four furlongs. And he goes 49.80. So that's 49 and four fifth seconds. So he's just a little under 50 seconds flat for that distance. And you can see it doesn't, it got a decent rating because there were so many workouts that morning, but nothing to, to really get excited about time wise. Then he comes back, as was the case, in from his first work to his second work, the first three furlong workout to the second three furlong workout. Now he's going faster again, and he goes from 49.80 or 49.4 fifths to 48.40, 48 and two fifths. And look at that ranking. That's 14th best of 102 that morning. Now, Ryan, what that indicates to me as someone who's been studying workouts for half a century, unfortunately for me to say, is the fact that normally a 48 and change workout would kind of have a ranking more like you see for uh, his first four furlong workout. It would be like 50th best of 82, something like that. For it to be 14th best of 102, Normally, that would be something like a 46 and change workout, maybe a low 47 and change workout, rather than a 48 and change. So that's where the rankings really help you. If you just saw the raw times, you'd say 48 and change would be a little average, maybe a little better than average. But when you see the 14th best of 102, that's much better than just kind of an average or a little better than average. That's an excellent workout time-wise, and it indicates that the track was not playing that fast that morning. 
It's a little bit of a slowish track. And you'll hear a trainer say, hey, the track was a little deep this morning or the track was playing a little slow. This just tells me, without having seen the workout or know anything more than the raw time and the ranking, that that track at Churchill Downs that morning, maybe it had rained the night before, or there could be all kinds of reasons. By the way, something for your uh, people to know, Ryan, especially the newcomers, there are a lot of factors that go into a workout, what the trainer is looking for. Uh, now, just on this pattern, I will tell you, most likely this horse's next workout will be five furlongs. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see what they're doing here. And what they'll probably do is come back and work them five furlongs in a moderate workout, like his first three furlong workout and his first four furlong workout. So he'll come back with a moderate five furlong workout, and then he'll get the quicker workout again as they're trying to build the foundation under this horse. So the workouts will get longer, but again, with each step, the second workout will tend to, they'll ask more of the horse and want more speed from the horse with that second workout at the distance. And by the way, this was a pattern employed by the great Ron McAnally, who trained the legendary John Henry. Because John Henry, I got to know his pattern so well that when I would show up in the morning, because Ron McAnally would tell me, we're going to work John Henry tomorrow morning, and I would show up for the workout. And I had my own stopwatch. Uh, this was when I was a writer for the Daily Racing Forum, and uh, it got to be kind of a joke between myself and Mr. McAnally. And he'd say, well, John, what are we going to do today for this workout? And I'd say, we're going to go. Now, let's say I was showing up for uh, this horse's uh, next workout, and I'd say, we're going to go a fairly easy or a moderate five furlongs. And Ron McAnally would say, well, that's right. And then we would watch him do it. And then like six days later, five days later, something in that neighborhood, we're back. And I'd show up again, and here's Ron McAnally, and he'd say, okay, John, now what are we going to do? And I'd say, we're going to go a faster five furlongs this time. So, and it was right, but it was, again, John Henry was along for so long, for so many years, and I saw him train so much that it wasn't that hard to see how Ron McAnally did it workout-wise. Now, the other thing to keep in mind, there are so many factors, as I was saying, that go into these workouts. First of all, how heavy is the rider? Is it a jockey? Is it a trainer? Some trainers work their own horses. Uh, you know, some tr trainers weigh a lot. And they're on there. That, and we pay attention to weight in the races, but people don't pay too much attention to the weight in the workouts. But it can have a big effect. Another thing is a lot of trainers, for instance, Bob Baffert is, is kind of of this uh, type of training, and so is Todd Pletcher on the East Coast. What you see, for instance, on this horse, um, you see that his most recent workout was four furlongs of 48.40. But with Bob Bamford and Todd Pletcher, that final time is only kind of the tip of the iceberg because they're trainers that really like to have their horses gallop out strongly. And it, to a certain extent, their workouts are longer than it appears with the final time that they're given. So that's something to always keep in mind, especially when you see a horse of Bob Baffert's or Todd Pletcher stretching out in distance in their races. You say, gee, can he go farther? Well, if you see the fact that Bob Baffert's horses have worked fast, you can extrapolate that to a certain extent that they're actually working even farther than that. That happens a lot with Bob Baffert in these races like a Breeders' Cup Classic or the Kentucky Derby at a mile and a quarter because he's really looking to build. You need that foundation to get that longer you know, for our purposes in the United States compared to the rest of the world, mile and a quarter is one of the longer distances we run in American racing. And so you want uh, the trainer to have this horse fit and, and really honed to go that longer distance. And you might say on the surface, well, gee, he hasn't worked as far as I would have preferred to see to bet on him or support him. But if you know it's Bob Baffert or Todd Pletcher, you're not as concerned about that because of the way they work out their horses. You'll see that when you see the videos of Todd Pletcher's and Bob Baffert's horses work. That a lot of times they'll keep the camera, you'll see them hit the finish, and they start to ease the horse a little bit, but that horse gallops out with more 
energy and more being asked more than a lot of trainers. A lot of trainers, pretty much, they'll have it, the horse shut it down for the for the most part at the finish. Uh, Lucas is not, at least he wasn't in the time he was here in Southern California. He wasn't of that ilk. What you saw for a Bob for a D Wayne Lucas workout, it was pretty much what that final time you see. And that was, there wasn't this little extra credit of after the, after the finish. So you have to know these little idiots. See, Charlie Whittingham was kind of like that. He was one that he didn't ask for, you know, tremendous gallop hours. Orders. Now he might, if the horse is coming off a lot, there's so many different circumstances of races that you're trying to prepare your horse for. Are you trying to prepare a horse for like that? In this case, a two-year-old, their first start, which will probably be at six furlongs, six and a half, maybe seven, but probably, you know, or maybe even five and a half. So five and a half, six, six and a half, seven. You're not going to have the horse have as long a workouts or gallop out as much as you would for a horse being prepared for, like I say, uh, say the Breeders' Cup Classic at a mile and a quarter or the Kentucky Derby at a mile and a quarter. You need longer workouts and you need stronger gallops out, gallop outs for those horses. There's also, did the horse work inside? Did the horse work outside? Did the horse work in company? Was it alone? Now, if the horse is alone, but typically they're not going to work as fast as they will if they have somebody with them. I mean, that's a general rule of thumb. Uh, but if you see a horse that can work fast by itself, that makes you pick up your head even more and think, hmm, this could be a really special horse. But even in company, Bob Baffert works pretty much everything in company. And uh, he, he likes that because he can kind of get a gauge on both horses in terms of, and I'll tell you another little tidbit on, D, on Bob Baffert. He was one of the first, if not the first, but at certainly one of the first trainers in the country, but including Southern California, that used uh, like a walkie-talkie where he could talk to the exercise rider on the horse. And he was laughed at and mocked for that in the beginning. Oh, look at that guy. Look at that new guy. Oh, he... And, and for instance, a lot of riders, veteran riders, kind of resent that because they feel like, well, I'm supposed to have a clock in my head. I don't need to be told. But I'm going to tell you something. It's very, very important. And Bob, Bob Baffert's technique of being able to talk to the riders has been now copied by many, many, many trainers all over the country because it makes sense. You're going to have less of a chance to screw up the workout if the guy can communicate directly to the rider. So this is where you say Bob Baffert took training, you know, it was innovative with his training technique. And as I say, he was laughed at at first. Oh, look at that quarter horse guy. And he's got to talk to his jockeys. But there's so many variables in these workouts that, like I say, you, you're not sure, you don't know unless you're standing there. And see, I often would be standing there with the trainer when these stakes horses, the top horses in the country would work out. I would know what they told the rider to do. I would know what their plan was, what the, how far away from the race and all kinds of aspects to the workout. So that makes it difficult when you're just looking like we are at these four workouts, just four workouts for this horse. Nevertheless, there is information that you can glean from this to draw conclusions. You cannot draw concrete conclusions because we don't have enough information. But I see patterns here. I see the three furlong, three furlong, four furlong, four furlong. You see a moderate workout, fast workout, moderate workout, faster workout. Off this pattern, like I say, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to predict his next workout will be five furlongs and it will be a moderate type workout. So this is a very good pattern for this young horse at this point. I mean, especially those two quicker workouts. The workout on September 26th, being under 35 seconds to be 34 and change is very encouraging because Lucas is one to let the horse, you know, come along. He's not going to, he knows we're not close to a race. So we're not wanting to push this horse so early especially with two-year-olds. If you push him, you can get buck shins. You can get shin, tender shins. Uh, you can get problems, you know, if you, and then you have to put them on the shelf. 
So you want to try to be able to keep the horse going without coming up with something. The more you push them, the more you're asking a possible thing, an issue to arise. So here's a case to where, as I say, the next workout, I, and if you did see a fast workout on the next one, it could be a mistake that the horse, for some reason, the rider misjudged it and went too fast, faster than Lucas would have preferred, and will be chewing the guy out when he gets back to the barn. Or it could be a case the horse is improving and just did it so easily that that the horse, you know, has reached a point where he, even when they're only asking a moderate workout from him, he comes up with a fast workout. So, uh, like I say, there's just many, many aspects to these workouts. Uh, it's kind of, it's, oh, look, Ryan, one of the greatest things about horse racing is the more you learn, the more you know there is to learn. <laughs> I mean, that sums up the game. When I first started in the game, I basically was going at it from the approach of betting and reading the racing form, trying to pick winners. But then I got involved in breeding. That's a whole fascinating subject. The history of the game, that's a whole fascinating subject. There's so many elements to this whole game. Workouts is one of them. I mean, it's kind of its own little world there of you know how, how to evaluate these workouts. And the better you are at it, the better you can be as a better, too. Well, John... Improbable luck, we have video of his latest workout and there were some quirky things in there if you're new to the game that you know you don't know what you're looking at. Um, I thought maybe we could watch it and just get a, a couple of thoughts from you, would you mind? And Not at all, let's do that. And by the way, this is very, very helpful. We have this more at our disposal today with this technology. Listen, back in the day, you know, we all we had was what we read again, you know, like at Equibase there or in the racing form or something. It's so much better to be able to watch a workout and, and just kind of decide for yourself uh, and see how. So let's go forward and let's take a look at this. I think that's a very good idea. And like I say, one of the first things we want to know, is the horse working alone or is it working in company? Let's find out. So here you see, they say inside. So that's telling you that uh, this horse is working inside a workmate. And you see by the sa saddle... Uh, on the saddles, the, the D. Wayne Lucas marking, so you know that both horses are for D. Wayne Lucas. So that's important too, because sometimes you'll see horses from different trainers work together. It's not all that often, but you will see that. So here we know we're dealing with two D. Wayne Lucas trained horses, and they're working as a team. We call these a team drill or a team workout. Now here they're kind of like little ants, so we can't really tell all that much about that, but that's okay. Ants grow up to be big horses, and <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll be able to hone in more as we see them come down the stretch. Now remember, this is the same stretch of the Kentucky Derby. You know, so this is one of the most world-famous stretches that you're going to see. Now again, uh, the horse that we're talking, Improbable Lux, down on the inside with the workmate to the outside. So they're pretty close together. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not bumping or anything, but they're very close. Now, you'd like to see this little bit of a surge from Improbable Luck right there, especially at the finish line. But then right there, you know, something happened. And we can't really tell. The rider would be able to tell you. We can't tell. Maybe the horse hit the rail and then broke stride. Maybe the horse just being green took a misstep or like bobbled. Uh, in which the rider had to then react. If it was, either way, if it, the horse hit the rail and broke stride, or if the horse didn't hit the rail and broke stride by bobbling or whatever, the rider had to take kind of hold there because the rider, they're, they're, it's such a precarious position on the back of a horse. They're so well balanced. When something like that happens, it's easy to unseat the rider. So the rider's trying to make sure he's got control and can hang on. So that's what you saw there. But uh, all in all, that was a pretty good drill by both of those horses. I mean, that was a pretty good workout. Uh, again, you, what you want to look at here too, Ryan, is the arms of the riders. You know, are they pumping madly uh, or do they have kind of the horse under a hold? See, the horse on the inside, he's kind of urging with his hands, but not, you know, like it's life and death. There was that, again, whatever happened there, some kind of an incident. But the word was that the horse was none the worse for wear, which is really good news because you would be concerned about that. You know, when you make a misstep, misstep like that, it raises the prospect of, you know, perhaps an injury even or something. But so the fact that 
The horse went on is a good sign. That's big. The horse didn't like stop right there because it was, you know, in some distress. But the horse went on, actually galloped out pretty good. And then, as I say, the, the report from the Lucas barn was that the horse was none the worse for rare for that kind of quirky incident. And that isn't all that is unusual for a race, horse that has never raced, hasn't even had that many workouts. I mean, this is like a young kid, you know, in school, just learning everything. I mean, these horses are learning their lives. You know, they're just youngsters and they're, they're green and, and inexperienced. And there's some horses that, you know, will be more professional from the beginning and won't do something goofy. There's other horses that are complete goofballs and everything in between. So and that's one of the great things about the horses themselves. While I, I grew up handicapping and looking at the, the racing form and the statistics and their records, listen, I love the animals because they're all, they got these personalities and, uh, you know, they're, they're individuals, everyone in that, a smart trainer like a, a D. Wayne Lucas or any of our great trainers like Bob Baffert, they try to, to learn the little quirks of each horse. I had talked earlier about John Henry and how Ron McAnally's training, I kind of got in tune with what he would do. But one of the greatest secrets to the success that Ron McAnally had with John Henry was he was a cantankerous gelding that had a mind of his own. And I mean really a mind of his own because they would start off in the morning with him at Ron McAnally's barn, which was the farthest away from the track at Santa Anita as possible. And Louis Senecola, his regular exercise rider, would be on him. And most trainers, and Ron McAnally at that time, he had like 30, 40 horses he had to train that morning to get out to the track. And there's only a limited time. So it's, you got to go, go, go. Well, they learned with John Henry, you let him dictate the terms. So John Henry, what he wanted to do was come out of his stall with, and then Louis Senecola would get on him. And he'd take three, four, maybe five steps and stop. And Louis would let him just look around, soak in the sun, whatever, just take it easy. And then after, you know, when he kind of felt like John was ready to go again, three, four more steps. It took them like literally a half hour to get to the racetrack for his morning exercise. Most horses, you get there in Less than five, I mean, you get there in three, four, five minutes to the track from Ron McAnally's barn. If you're close to the track, it's like one or two minutes. But John Henry did it on his schedule. And then when he got to the track, he would stand there when he first walked onto the track and really wanted to soak things in, even more than his trip there. And he wanted to watch all the horses and the scenery and everything, and they would let him do it. And when he was ready to go, he went. And that, that was a huge, huge, huge part of his success. Why he lasted so long, why he was so successful, because they didn't try to fit him. Let's say he's a, a square peg in a round hole. They were going to fit, you know, let him be a round peg in a round hole. They, you know. And there's so many trainers that want to be the boss and show that they're the, in, the master and so forth, and they want the rider. And there's riders like that, too. And the rider will be, I'm going to show you and whatever. That would have completely backfired with John Henry. He would have never been the horse that he was in any way, shape, or form. That was just a, a tremendously important part of his success. And for, for newer fans, I don't want to cut you off, John. John Henry wound up becoming... A two-time horse of the year. That's right. Multiple Eclipse Award winner. That's right. And when we say two-time horse of the year, he was, in 1984, was his last horse of the year Eclipse Award, and he was a nine-year-old. Yep. And, and nine yep. years old would be like 40 years old as a human well, being. Well, he's right? the oldest one, and we'll never, that's such a, a an exceptional accomplishment that odds of us ever seeing that again are virtually none. I mean, you can never say never. My dad said that they'll never uh, break Lou Gehrig's record for most consecutive games, but then Cal Ripkins came along and Junior and said, "Well, you know what? I'm going to break that record." So, you know, anything can happen. But the, the odds of another nine-year-old horse of the year are very, very long. I mean, it, it just is most likely. Not, I don't think we'll ever see it again. And you know, to bring it back to 
put a bow, I think, on some of the wonderful stuff you're talking about here, because John Henry clearly was a difficult horse to train with a supreme talent, one of the greatest yep. horses ever. I think what you're talking about, essentially, John, correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like every horse is a puzzle. That's right. Good and, way to put it. And every trainer, if they're a master, like Lucas, yep. uh, Baffert, any of these yep. ones that we would consider, they're trying to unlock the puzzle. That's they're trying right. to. So when we watch this video today together of Improbable Luck, it's just another step in the puzzle process, right? Well, it's And you never know because, for instance, one of the greatest trainers in the history of American racing was Sonny Jim Fitzsimmons. I mean, and for the whole, like, first half of the uh, 20th century, that guy was by far regarded as the top trainer in the country. And he had a horse called Seabiscuit that he couldn't get to be successful at all. And it ended up with a trainer by the name of Silent Tom Smith. And he learned the little quirks for Seabiscuit and everything. And he turned out to be such a, a top horse, winner of the Santa Anita Handicap and, and, and a horse of the year, but had a book written about him and a movie made about him, even though that's so far long ago. But that's it's a great story. But part of that story was that that first trainer, and we're not talking about some guy that didn't know what he was doing as a trainer. He was the most accomplished trainer in the country. And yet that horse, for whatever reason, they ju it just didn't work. When he got to another trainer, that guy saw something in the horse, knew how to bring the best out of him. That's how we ended up with Seabiscuit. So what's great about that, to, to explain it, to put it too, because that's an incredible story, uh, when people are watching these workouts now, what we want them to take away from it is this is just that education, that puzzle-solving right. process. Work. Perfect. And um, today we watched one of his major life moments, working inside of horses. That's this right. Is his first time. So uh, I, we want to thank you, John, for helping us dissect this puzzle and understand how it's all working together. And uh, we look forward to, to more incredible moments from Improbable Luck and maybe another interview from you down the line. Thank you so much. Look forward to it.